Hello and welcome back to Animal Sciences 142. Today we're going to continue our lecture on chemistry. Specifically we're going to talk more about the pH scale and biological macromolecules. So in the second half of today's lecture we're going to talk about organic compounds. That is compounds that are based on a carbon skeleton. But before we get there we're going to talk about inorganic compounds. That is compounds that do not contain carbon but are nonetheless very important to biological systems. And of course this includes compounds like water. Water was H2O, a compound created by a covalent bonding of hydrogen to oxygen. And of course there's also the ionic compounds or salts. Salts are basically ionic compounds that contain cations and anions that dissociate when they're placed in water. That is the cation and the anion will break apart and circulate freely throughout the solution. All salts are also called electrolytes because they can conduct current in a solution. So an example of a salt and an electrolyte is sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is common old table salt, but when you put it in water, the sodium ions and the chloride ions dissociate and will also conduct an electrical charge. Another group of very important inorganic compounds are the acids and bases. Now these are also electrolytes because they dissociate in solution, but acids and bases give rise to either hydrogen ions for acids or hydroxyl ions for bases and we'll talk about why they're so very important in just a few slides. So your textbook defines an acid is a proton donor, that is anything that gives off a proton in solution. But you'll probably remember back to the last lecture where I said we never give up protons. If we were to have an element that gave up protons it would in fact become a different element. And that's still true. So what we're talking about here are actually hydrogen ions. Take a look at hydrogen on the periodic table find it you see that it has an atomic number of one which means it has one proton and one electron and now take a look at the atomic mass the atomic mass is still one meaning that we don't have any neutrons so what happens when hydrogen gives off an electron essentially all that's left over is a proton and so that's what we mean when we say that acids give off protons if you feel better about it you can memorize that acids are things that give off hydrogen ions and that's the definition that I'm going to stick with for the rest of the lecture so an example of an acid can be seen below. We have good old hydrochloric acid. Now this is stomach acid and when we put it in water it completely dissociates into hydrogen ions and chloride ions. Now because it completely dissociates and gives off lots of hydrogen ions we call HCl a very strong acid. Bases on the other hand are things that take up hydrogen ions out of solution. For example sodium hydroxide is a very very strong base with a pH of around 12 We'll talk about pH in a few slides, but what you need to know is that a pH of 12 indicates it's pretty darn alkaline. And so sodium hydroxide is a very strong base that if we put in solution will scavenge up all the hydrogen ions. And when it does that, those hydrogen ions will combine with the hydroxyl ions to become water. So there's actually a name for this process and it's called neutralization. So let's take a look at a neutralization reaction. So on the left hand side of the equation you can see we have HCl or hydrochloric acid. That's going to dissociate into hydrogen ions and chloride ions in solution. And we also have sodium hydroxide. That's a very strong base and that's going to dissociate into sodium ions and hydroxyl ions. So basically memorize that hydrogen ions and hydroxyl ions are sort of opposites. They can cancel each other out. So when we add the strong acid and the strong base together, what we get is that the hydrogen ions from HCl and the hydroxyl ions from NaOH combine to make good old neutral water. And the other thing that happens is that the sodium from sodium hydroxide combines with the chloride from hydrogen chloride to make good old table salt. So we can take a strong acid, a strong base, and put them together, and what we get out of it is water and a little bit of table salt. So up to this point we've talked about strong acids and strong bases. That is things that dissociate completely in a solution to give off all their hydrogen ions or in the case of strong bases all their hydroxyl ions. What we haven't talked about are weak acids and weak bases. A good example of a weak acid would be let's say acetic acid that we find in vinegar. It incompletely dissociates in solution and the extent to which it dissociates depends on the hydrogen ion concentration of the surrounding solution. On the other hand, an example of a weak base would be sodium bicarbonate. Sodium bicarbonate, otherwise known as baking soda, uh, dissociates incompletely in solution. 
and the extent to which it gives off hydroxyl ions will depend on the acidity or alkalinity of the surrounding solution. So things that are weak acids or weak bases can be very good buffers. A buffer is something that resists dramatic changes in the hydrogen ion or hydroxyl concentration of a solution. And this is very important because the body can only tolerate a very narrow range of pH or acidity. And so we have molecules like sodium bicarbonate in our bloodstream and body fluids that are there to bind up extra hydrogen ions and hydroxyl ions. So we measure the relative concentration of hydrogen ions and hydroxyl ions using something called the pH scale. The pH scale basically runs from 0 to 14 with 7 in the middle called neutral. So at a pH of 7, the number of hydrogen ions and the number of hydroxyl ions exactly balance each other. An example of a solution that would have a pH of 7 would be distilled or deionized water. This would have equal numbers of hydrogen ions as it does hydroxyl ions. Okay, think about distilled water. Is it corrosive? Can you get on your skin? Sure, you can drink it, you can do whatever, it's not going to hurt you. On the other hand, things towards either side of the scale, whether they're acidic or basic, can be harmful. And we'll talk about those in just a minute. So anything below a pH of 7 is said to be acidic. That is, it has more hydrogen ions than it does hydroxyl ions. And the relative concentration of hydrogen ions increases as we go down the scale in number. For example, something with a pH of 1 would have a lot more hydrogen ions than something with a pH of 3. On the other hand, things that are above 7 in pH would have more hydroxyl ions than they do hydrogen ions, so they would be basic or alkaline. Again, the number of hydrogen ions decreases dramatically as we move from, let's say, 7 to 14. Now that we've talked about the acidic and basic ends of the scale, we're going to look at some common examples of both acids and bases. The first of these is probably one you encounter almost every morning, and that would be good old coffee. Good old coffee has a pH of around 5, which means it has more hydrogen ions than, let's say, distilled water is. Now, coffee is acidic, but it's not dangerous, right? You can get it on your hands, you can drink it, but if you drink too much, you might get a little bit of acid reflux or indigestion. A little bit further down the pH scale, we have lemon juice. Lemon juice weighs in with a pH of 2, which means it has a lot more hydrogen ions than coffee does. Again, you can get lemon juice on your skin, you can put it in lemonade, but if you ever gotten a cut, you notice it's fairly painful. So lemon juice is a lot stronger acid than, let's say, coffee is. In fact, if you've ever made ceviche, uh, this is a dish where we take raw fish and we put it in either lemon or lime juice. And the juice in the lemon or lime will actually sort of cook the proteins in there. So if you've never had ceviche, take a minute and do a Google search and see what that looks like. Weighing in with a pH of around 9 is good old sodium bicarbonate, or baking soda. Baking soda is a weak base, that is, a base that dissociates incompletely in solution, and it gives off hydroxyl ions. Now remember, what do hydroxyl ions do? Well, they bind up hydrogen ions, and so they can neutralize an acid. So baking soda is a very common weak base that we find in your house and also in your bloodstream. It's a very good buffer. That is, it resists large changes in pH by regulating the hydrogen ion and hydroxyl ion concentration in a solution. So we use sodium bicarbonate as a buffer in the hospital, and you can also use it around your house. Another example of a weak base would be Philips Milk of Magnesia. Philips Milk of Magnesia has a pH around 9.5 to 10, and this is a weak base, again, that is used to neutralize stomach acid in people that have an overly acidic stomach. Just like baking soda, it can be handled without gloves or anything like that because it's a weak base. It's not very corrosive. One thing you might notice about bases, though, is that in solution they tend to have a slippery feel to them, and this is characteristic of bases.
Now one very important thing you should know about the pH scale is that it is a logarithmic scale. Now what this means is that a single change in one pH unit reflects a ten times change in the number of hydrogen ions or hydroxyl ions. For example, as I move from a pH of 6 to a pH of 5, the number of hydrogen ions has increased 10 times. As I move from a pH of 5 to a pH of 3, it is increased 100 times. That is, 5 to 4 is one change, and 4 to 3 is another. And remember, each of these unit changes indicates a tenfold difference in hydrogen ion concentration. So here it would be 10 times 10. And so a pH of 3 has 100 times the number of hydrogen ions that something with a pH of 5 does. So now that we've learned about pH, I want you to take a look at these two solutions and tell me which one is more acidic. If you said the one on the left, you're correct. The one on the left has more hydrogen ions, so it would be more acidic. Now tell me which one would have a lower pH number. If you said the one on the left again, you're correct. Remember that the more hydrogen ions that something has, the lower the pH number it will have. Now you might be wondering why I'm going on so much about pH and hydrogen ions when these really aren't organic molecules. Well, changes in pH can affect several things inside the body, including molecule transport, protein structure, and also function. To demonstrate the importance of pH on protein structure, I'd like you to try this simple experiment here. Go get a raw egg, still in the shell, and soak it in vinegar for two days. Now after you do that, you're going to notice that things change. First of all, the shell will eventually dissolve away, uh, taking away the calcium carbonate and leaving more of the protein. Now the protein inside the egg, which was sort of clear, will actually coagulate and become opaque, just like it's been cooked. So the point here is that very acidic or very basic environments can denature proteins. And when a protein is denatured, it changes shape and it also changes its function. And that's one of the reasons why we have to maintain a relatively narrow window of pH in the mammalian body, usually around 7.3 or thereabouts. Now that we've learned about acids, bases, and ions, we're going to move on to talk about organic compounds. Remember, organic compounds are compounds that are based on a carbon skeleton. We also call these biological macromolecules. And there are four categories that we're going to talk about. Carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. And learning to identify and know the functions of biological molecules, there's a few questions you're going to want to ask. First of all, which elements are involved? Some of these compounds will involve carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, where some will involve carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. The other thing is to look at the ratio of various elements. Some contain large numbers of carbon and hydrogen, whereas others have more nitrogen and more oxygen. And finally, be able to watch out and identify special functional groups. A functional group is just basically a part of a molecule that can help you identify that molecule and let's say classify it as an amino acid or something like that. Before we can talk about macromolecules, we need to talk about the parts from which they are constructed. And these parts are called monomers. Remember, the word mono means one. And so a monomer is a single part that can join together to make bigger parts. And these monomers link together to form polymers through a process called dehydration synthesis. So first of all, let's back up and take a look at that phrase. What does the word polymer mean? Well, poly means many. So a polymer is a group of molecules linked together by chemical bonds. And the process that we use to do this is a special type of covalent bonding called dehydration synthesis. Now one thing you want to ask about monomers is are they soluble in water? Some of them are and some of them are not. Okay, let's take a look at an example of dehydration synthesis. So first let's start out with our monomer. Remember a monomer is just a simple building block for a larger molecule. Now each of those four groups of macromolecules have different monomers. For right now we're not concerned with what those monomers look like but we should know that they are very small molecules like the one pictured here. In contrast, a polymer is a group of monomers that are linked together through chemical bonds. Again, the polymers for proteins and carbohydrates and fats will look very, very different, but they're all linked together in the same way. That is, their monomers are joined together covalently through the process of dehydration synthesis. So let's take a closer look at this process called dehydration synthesis. Now what does that word seem to mean to you? Well, first let's take a look at the first word, dehydration. 
What does that indicate? That's right, we're going to lose some water. And the second word, synthesis, what does that mean? Well, that means we're going to make something. So dehydration synthesis is a process where we take two monomers and we link them together with covalent bonds. And in the process, we lose a water molecule. And the net result is we create a polymer, a larger molecule that's been created through covalent bonding. Now you should remember back to the previous lecture and recall that reactions that combine smaller units to make a larger unit are anabolic reactions. That is, they're building reactions. And anabolic reactions usually take energy. That is, they need energy input in order to happen. Now that we've looked at a generalized example of dehydration synthesis, let's look at the real thing. So at the top of the screen, you can see we have two sort of pentagon-shaped molecules. I don't expect you to know right away what these are, but I can tell you these are monosaccharides, or simple sugars. Now we can stick these two molecules together through dehydration synthesis and make a disaccharide, that is, a sugar like sucrose. And in the process of making this disaccharide, we give off a water molecule, and this is characteristic of dehydration synthesis. The opposite of dehydration synthesis is something called hydrolysis. Hydrolysis is a catabolic reaction where we take a large polymer and we break it into smaller monomers. In order to do this, however, we actually need to add a molecule of water in order to break the polymer into monomers. And the result of hydrolysis is that we take a large polymer and break it down into smaller monomers. Again, this is an example of a catabolic reaction, a reaction that breaks down large things into smaller things. And many catabolic reactions actually liberate energy, so an example of hydrolysis would be the digestion of things like proteins and carbohydrates within the digestive tract. We break down these very large molecules into smaller molecules. In the process, we liberate energy, which can be used to do work throughout the body. Here's another example of hydrolysis. Here we have maltose, which is a disaccharide, and we add to it some water. And what we get out of this reaction is two smaller molecules, which are glucose. And so, again, hydrolysis is a catabolic reaction, breaking down large molecules into smaller molecules. Now, one thing I haven't talked about so far is that usually for this catabolic reaction to occur, we have to have a specific enzyme that can catalyze the reaction. An enzyme is a special type of protein that can help speed up chemical reactions. For example, we have an enzyme that helps to break down lactose, which is a special type of milk sugar. We'll talk more about lactose and the lactase enzyme in just a few slides. So now that we've learned about dehydration synthesis and also hydrolysis, let's go on to talk about the first group of biologic molecules called the carbohydrates. Now carbohydrates include things such as sugars, starches, and other molecules. We find them a lot in food. For example, we can find simple sugar in things like Pepsi Cola, and we can find starches in things like potatoes and potato chips. The elements involved here are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and this is why they are called carbohydrates. Now most carbohydrates that are obtained through the diet are actually derived from photosynthesis, that is, they're derived from plants that use sunlight to make carbohydrates. The monomers for carbohydrates are called monosaccharides, and the polymers are called polysaccharides. And remember, the process of linking monomers into polymers is dehydration synthesis. And in general, the monomers of most carbohydrates are water-soluble. Now there's lots of different functions of carbohydrates, both in plants and in animals. In plants, carbohydrates are the principal form of energy storage. For example, the potato plant you see at right will actually store its excess energy as starch within the root or tuber of the plant. Some plants also store energy as sugar. For example, if you take a look at a mango tree, the sugars in the mangoes are a form of energy storage. Now there are very few starches that are created within the mammalian body, but one that you should know about is glycogen. Glycogen is a starch or polysaccharide created by linking lots of individual glucose molecules together. And glycogen is a very important energy storage form within both the liver and the skeletal muscle. Another use for carbohydrates in both plants and animals is as structural components. For example, cellulose is a specific type of polysaccharide that's found in woody material. And that's what makes trees and other lignified plants hard and able to grow very, very tall because of this very hard cellulose. Another type of structural components found not in plants but found in some insects and crustaceans is something called chitin.
Uh, chitin, again, is a polysaccharide that forms the outer skeleton or exoskeleton of things like locusts, uh, bees, and even things like shrimp and lobsters. So we said before that the monomers of carbohydrates are called monosaccharides. Remember, mono meaning one and saccharide meaning sugar. So simple sugars is what we have here. So here's two examples of simple sugars, glucose and fructose. Now they're almost identical. I'm not going to make you be able to distinguish these on the exam, but you should be able to look at either one of those and say, well, that looks like a monosaccharide to me. We have carbon, we have hydrogen, and we have oxygen, and we also have something that has one, two, three, four, five, six, six carbons, so it's probably a monosaccharide. So glucose is probably the most important monosaccharide in the body. If you know anything about blood sugar, you know that we have to have a certain level of glucose in the blood to keep the brain running properly. On the other hand, disaccharides are two monosaccharides which are linked together through covalent bonding. So here's some disaccharides you've probably heard about. Starting at the bottom, we can see sucrose. Sucrose is actually created through the covalent bonding of glucose to fructose, and this gives us sucrose, otherwise known as table sugar. Above that, we have another disaccharide, maltose, and above that, a third one which you've probably heard of called lactose. Where do you think we find lactose? If you said milk, you're correct. Lactose is a special type of sugar found in milk and other dairy products, and it's created through the covalent bonding of glucose and galactose. So moving on from disaccharides, we're going to look at polysaccharides. Polysaccharides are made up of several different monosaccharides linked together by covalent bonds. And so starch is a common example of a polysaccharide. Where do we find starch in the house? Well, we find starch in potatoes, we find starch in breads, and we find starch in other complex carbohydrates. Now remember that all starches are in fact derived from plant sources, but we do have one important polysaccharide within the human body, and that is called glycogen. Remember, glycogen is a polysaccharide, which is a storage form of energy found both in the muscles and the liver. Our next group of biological macromolecules are known collectively as lipids. Now lipids include things like oils, fats, waxes, phospholipids, and also steroids. Just like carbohydrates, we have the elements carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen involved here, but we have a lot more repeating carbon and hydrogen chains. And some lipids have phosphorus and nitrogen as well. Now one thing you should know about lipids is that for the most part, the monomers and polymers are both water insoluble. That is, they don't mix readily with water. For example, if you've ever made, let's say, salad dressing out of using a little bit of oil and a little bit of vinegar, which contains mainly water, you can shake those up and make an emulsion for a very short period of time, but over time that oil will separate from the water. So lipids and water do not mix. Now lipids have several very important functions in the body, and one of these is for energy storage. Lipids, for example, fat, stores a tremendous amount of energy. When compared to protein or carbohydrate, it stores over twice the amount of energy per unit of mass or weight. And so we tend to store a lot of our excess energy as fat rather than storing it as carbohydrate. Another important function of lipids is protection and cushioning of body organs. For example, the kidneys are encapsulated in a nice thick layer of fat which prevents them from rotating around and inadvertently kinking the exit of the kidneys called the ureters. Lipids are also very important structural components of cell membranes as we'll see just in a minute. There's two types of lipids we'll find there, phospholipids and also cholesterol, and both of them are important to the structure of the cell membrane. And finally, certain types of lipids, for example steroids, can be important chemical messengers, also known as hormones. So there's four different types of lipids that we're going to talk about in this lecture. The first of these are the neutral fats, or triglycerides. Then we have the phospholipids, the steroids, and also the eicosanoids. So let's start with the triglyceride. As the name implies, we have three of something and one of the other thing. And what we have three of is three fatty acid tails linked together on a glycerol backbone. So the left side of the screen, you see the glycerol. The right side of the screen, you see we're adding one of the fatty acid tails. And we do this through the process of, that's right, dehydration synthesis. So once we added another two fatty acid tails, we'll now have a functional triglyceride. Now triglycerides are probably the most common type of lipid that you're going to come across. That is, we find them in our diet. For example, if you get a pack of potato chips and you look on back and see that it has five grams of fat, 
Well, that fat is going to be in the form of triglyceride. And there's two different types of triglycerides, the saturated fats and the unsaturated fats. Now, saturated fats or saturated triglycerides are named as such because they are saturated with as much hydrogen as they can have. Remember that I said in the last lecture that carbon is a unique type of element and that it can bind with up to four different atoms. And that's exactly what's happening here. Each of the carbons in the three of the fatty acid tails is bound to four other atoms. And what this means is that the hydrocarbon tails are saturated with as much hydrogen as they can have. As a result, the tails tend to be very straight and they tend to stack very closely together. And this tends to make saturated fats solid at room temperature. Now because they're solid at room temperature, they tend to be, one, very tasty, num num, and they also tend to cause heart disease. That's because once we eat these fats, they sometimes settle out in the bloodstream and can literally block an artery or arterial, thereby compromising the blood flow to the heart. So examples of saturated fats include most animal-derived fats. That is things like cheese and butter and steak. On the other hand, unsaturated triglycerides, or unsaturated fats, tend to have carbon-carbon double bonds within the fatty acid tails. And as a result of having these carbon-carbon double bonds, we don't have as many hydrogens as we could. For example, let's take a look at these carbons right here. You can see that each of these carbons is bound to three other atoms, but it could be bound to four. But as a result of having carbon-carbon double bonds, we have one less hydrogen that we can bind to. Now, not binding to this extra hydrogen creates a unique morphology in the molecule. Even though it's drawn straight here, the unsaturated fats actually tend to have a more three-dimensional shape and be a little bit more kinky. As a result, they don't tend to stack together quite as neatly, so they tend to be liquid at room temperature. So examples of unsaturated fats are most oils and plant fats. For example, Wesson oil or corn oil, anything that's liquid at room temperature is a good example of an unsaturated fat. Our next group of lipids are called the phospholipids. Now unlike triglycerides, phospholipids only have two fatty acid tails. And these fatty acid tails are hydrophobic. Like normal fats, they don't like water. On the other hand, if we take a look at the head of a phospholipid, it has phosphorus in there, and so the head tends to be hydrophilic, that is, water-loving. And so we have this one lipid molecule that has two different properties. The tails don't like water, and the head does like water. Now these dynamic properties of the phospholipids makes them very good at making up the cell membrane. The cell membrane, as it turns out, is made up mainly of phospholipids, and these phospholipids are organized into a bilayer. That is, we have the heads facing out on the outside of the cell and the heads facing in on the inside of the cell. Remember, what do the heads like? Well, the heads like water. And as it turns out, cells have plenty of water inside the cell and also plenty of water outside the cell. We call that extracellular fluid. And so the heads tend to gravitate towards that water. And what happens with the tails is the tails are basically pointing inward, trying to limit as much water as possible from that cell membrane. Our next group of lipids are called steroids. Steroids are a group of lipids composed of four interconnected rings. Now look at these rings and remember that at each corner of the ring we have a carbon atom. So you don't have to be able to recognize or draw a steroid molecule, but what you do need to understand is that steroid molecules are made up of four interconnected carbon rings. Now like other fats, steroids are fat soluble. That is, we can dissolve a cholesterol molecule in another lipid molecule. And that's something we should know for fats in general, is that like dissolves like. For example, you can take a triglyceride like butter and dissolve it in another triglyceride like olive oil. So fats can dissolve fats, but water cannot dissolve fat, and neither can protein nor carbohydrate dissolve fat. Now the other thing about steroids is that many are hormones. And remember, hormones are a special type of chemical messengers produced by endocrine tissues throughout the body. Now, the most common type of steroid that we're going to talk about is the molecule cholesterol. Cholesterol is important in cell membranes, but you probably also know that it's important in the diet. Cholesterol is a type of lipid that, if you get too much of it, can put you at risk for heart disease. And so things like eggs and shellfish and saturated fats tend to be associated with higher than normal levels of cholesterol. And so we tend to want to reduce the cholesterol in our body. Now one of the reasons that your body manufactures cholesterol is that it is also the basis of other molecules in the body. 
For example, cholesterol is the base molecule for the hormone estrogen produced by females and also for the hormone testosterone produced by males. And in fact, you can see that these hormones are almost identical, that there's just a few carbons difference between estrogen, what we think of as a female sex hormone, and testosterone, which is a male sex hormone. Now our last group of lipid molecules are called eicosanoids. Eicosanoids are derived from a 20-carbon fatty acid chain called arachidonic acid. And eicosanoids include things like prostaglandins and leukotrienes. Now prostaglandins and leukotrienes have several different important functions in the body. For example, they help with blood clotting, with blood pressure maintenance, and they're also potent mediators of inflammation. For example, when tissues are damaged through physical injury, uh, they tend to release lots of fatty acids, and these fatty acids are converted into prostaglandins, which causes inflammation. Now, inflammation is a normal part of the repair process. It brings more blood to the tissues, it also brings more raw materials, and helps to wash out potential pathogens. On the other hand, inflammation can also be quite painful. And so we've devised several types of drugs that will block the synthesis of prostaglandins from arachidonic acid and therefore block the pain. And these drugs are called NSAIDs, or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. These include things like aspirin, meloxicam, ibuprofen, and others. So a lot of the over-the-counter painkillers that we take are in fact NSAIDs that block the synthesis of prostaglandins from arachidonic acid. Okay, our next group of macromolecules are the proteins. Now, like carbohydrates and fats, proteins contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but here is something new. They also contain lots of nitrogen. And so nitrogen is a particular element that tends to be found mainly in proteins. The monomers for proteins are amino acids, and the polymers are called polypeptides. Now, several polypeptides can link together to form a functional protein. Now generally, the amino acids will be water-soluble, but the larger proteins may not be water-soluble. Okay, there are lots of different functions for proteins in the body. First of all, proteins are what enzymes are formed from. Enzymes are special biological catalysts that help to speed up certain types of chemical reactions. Another important function of proteins in the body is as structural proteins. We have proteins in most all of the tissues of the body. For example, if we take a look at our fingernails and our hair, we find the protein keratin. Keratin is a tough protein found in fingernails, hair, and even skin. It helps to give it rigidity. It also helps to waterproof our skin. Another example of a structural protein is something called collagen. Collagen is a tough, fibrous protein that gives our skin its strength and durability. It also helps to hold all the calcium together in our bones. So we find it in skin, we find it in bones, and we find it in jello. That's right, your favorite dessert as a child is in fact jam-packed full of collagen. What's more disturbing though is to find out where exactly that collagen came from. And it came from pig hooves, pig ears, and things of the like. So we tend to boil down animal parts and liberate the collagen, and that collagen can be mixed with water and with fruit juice, and at room temperature it will basically coagulate to make a colloid that we know as jello. And so jello is an example of a dish that has lots of collagen in it. Now in addition to making structural proteins in the body and also enzymes, proteins can also be chemical messengers otherwise known as hormones. We already said that steroids were examples of hormones, but there's also protein hormones as well. For example, the hormone insulin is actually an amino acid or protein hormone. Another function of proteins is that they serve for antibodies. Antibodies are special defense molecules that are made by the white blood cells of the body, and they help to eliminate certain types of pathogens from the body. We'll talk more about hormones and antibodies next semester. Now remember, proteins are created from the monomers, which are known as amino acids. Amino acids have three distinct functional groups that can help you identify amino acids and distinguish them from other molecules in the body. The first of these functional groups is called a carboxylic acid group, that is COOH. Another distinctive functional group in an amino acid is the amine group. An amine group contains NH2. And remember, N is nitrogen and H is hydrogen. And we already said that amino acids and proteins contain lots and lots of nitrogen. Thus far, it's really been the only compound that we've looked at that contains significant amounts of nitrogen. So if you happen to see a molecule that has nitrogen in it, you want to start thinking, is that molecule an amino acid, a polypeptide, or a protein? 
Now the third functional group that we find in proteins is something called the R group. And I want you to think of R as meaning the rest of the molecule, because the R group can be very variable. There's 20 different types of R groups that go along with the different types of amino acids. And so you don't have to recognize and be able to distinguish these amino acids, but you do have to recognize what part is the carboxylic acid group, which part is the amine group, and which part is the R group. So here's a diagram of what an actual amino acid would look like. So first of all, we have our central carbon in the very middle of the molecule. To the left of that, we can see our amino group, which contains the NH2. And then we can see on the right-hand side of the molecule, the carboxylic acid group, or the COOH. Now, attached to that central carbon, we also have the rest of the molecule, the R group. So just like other biological monomers, amino acids are linked together by dehydration synthesis to make polypeptides. So a polypeptide is created through the covalent bonding of three or more amino acids. If the polypeptide contains 50 or more amino acids, it may in fact be called a complete protein. But you should know that most proteins are in fact very large macromolecules which may contain up to 10,000 amino acids. Now, as we said in the last slide, most complete proteins tend to be very large macromolecules composed of hundreds, if not thousands, of amino acids. And so as a result, proteins tend to have three or four different levels of structure. The first of these levels of structure is called the primary structure. And the primary structure of a protein is determined by the sequence of amino acids. The next level of structure is called the secondary structure. The secondary structure is determined by special folding or bending that happens as a result of hydrogen bonding between adjacent amino and carboxylic acid groups. As a result of this hydrogen bonding, we get two types of morphologies, something called an alpha helix, as you see here, or we can also get a different morphology called a beta pleated sheet. Now, in most cases, this secondary structure is going to continue folding, that is through the formation of both covalent bonds and also hydrogen bonds. In this case, we're going to get something called the tertiary structure. The tertiary structure tends to give the protein a compact ball-like or globular anatomy. And finally, when two or more polypeptide chains aggregate in a regular manner to form a complex protein, the protein is said to have a quaternary structure. Okay, our last group of molecules are the nucleic acids. As the name implies, the nucleic acids are found within the nucleus of a cell. The elements involved here are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So like proteins, they have nitrogen, but we also have phosphorus. The monomers here are called nucleotides, and the polymers are called nucleic acids. Now, nucleic acids and nucleotides are generally water-soluble. There are about three different uses of nucleic acids and nucleotides in the body. The first of these is to serve as a genetic instruction set. As you probably already know, your DNA molecule is found mainly within the nucleus of your cell, and it basically contains all the information needed to generate an entirely new you. And this is the information that you will pass on to your children that will dictate how they will develop as well. Now, DNA and RNA are also both very important in protein synthesis. As it turns out, the DNA molecule has over 50,000 genes on it, and these genes are basically recipes for the production of certain types of protein that are needed in the body. And finally, a third use of nucleic acids is actually in energy metabolism. ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, is not really a nucleic acid so much as a nucleotide which is used to transmit energy throughout the cell in order to fuel various cellular processes. Now remember that nucleic acids are based on the monomers called nucleotides, and each of these nucleotides has three components. The first of these is a 5-carbon sugar called a ribose sugar. Next we have something called a phosphate. A phosphate is a certain type of ion where we have phosphorus bound to oxygen. And finally we have something called a nitrogenous base. That is, we have a nitrogen-containing compound, and all three of these components make up a nucleotide. So here's sort of a pictorial diagram of what a nucleotide would look like. You can see that the molecule is based on a 5-carbon or pentose sugar, and attached to that we have a phosphate ion, and attached to the sugar we also have our nitrogenous base. So where a nucleotide would be the monomers for nucleic acids, a polynucleotide would be a type of polymer. That is, several nucleotides bound together by covalent bonds formed through the process of, of dehydration synthesis. Another name for a polynucleotide is simply a nucleic acid.
Now one thing you should notice is the sugar and phosphate groups of the molecule basically form the backbone of the molecule, whereas the real genetic information is coded in the nitrogenous bases. And in DNA, we have four different types of nitrogenous bases, thiamine, adenine, cytosine, and guanine. Now it's important to point out that this figure doesn't actually show a whole DNA molecule. So what we see here is a single strand of DNA. In truth, the DNA molecule is a double-stranded molecule, much like a ladder that's been twisted. The outside of this ladder is made up of the sugar phosphate backbone, and the inside rungs of this ladder are made up of our nitrogenous bases. And here we have two nitrogenous bases that are joined together by covalent bonds. And what you can notice is that the bonding of one nitrogenous base to the other nitrogenous base is predictable. For example, guanine always pairs with cytosine, and adenine always pairs with thiamine. And so if we know one side of the DNA molecule, we know what the other side will be too. So remember that DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA is a very large molecule or polymer made up of individual nucleotides, which are the monomers. Remember the nucleotides contain three distinct groups, a phosphate group, a five carbon sugar, and a ring shaped nitrogenous base. Now our last nucleic acid is in fact not a nucleic acid. This is actually a nucleotide and it's known as ATP or adenosine triphosphate. Now like other nucleotides, it has a five carbon sugar. It also has a nitrogenous base but instead of just having one phosphate group, it actually has three phosphate groups. And that's why we call it ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Now, unlike the other nucleotides we've seen as far, ATP doesn't contain any type of genetic information. What it does do, however, is it is a very potent energy transmission molecule. That is, it helps to carry energy to various places within the cell to allow that cell to do work. And so ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, will break down into ADP plus a free phosphate group. Now in the process of this catabolic reaction, energy is released, and this energy is used to fuel various cellular processes. For example, one place in the body where we utilize ATP is within our muscle cells. In order for a muscle to contract, we must have calcium, but we must also have energy. And the energy in this case comes most directly from ATP. So at the left side of the equation, you see we have our adenosine triphosphate, and we use an enzyme called an ATPase to break that down into ADP, or adenosine diphosphate, plus a free phosphate. And in the process, energy is released, and that energy is used to help, for example, contract muscle. Now even though this process is a catabolic process, it's important to know that we can also push the equation in the reverse direction. That is, we can take a free phosphate group, add it to ADP, put some energy in, and basically form a new ATP molecule. And so ATP is not like a one-time use battery, but it's a rechargeable battery. We can discharge it and release energy, or we can put some energy back into it, stick a phosphate back on it, and recharge it. You now reach the end of part two of our lecture on chemistry of life. Following this lecture, there will be a few question slides that will quiz you on your knowledge of biological macromolecules and also the pH scale. Now remember, your performance on these questions will not be recorded, and so it will not affect your grade. However, if you score less than 70% on these questions, I suggest you go back and review this lecture again.